Thank you for joining us. It is fantastic to get the Inspire crew together. Um, this is our, we're in our second plus year of doing this session. And if you ever want to listen to old sessions, you can always grab past episodes on our site or your stream, your favorite streaming platform. Our podcast is called Inspired. You know, a lot of HR leaders we work with are feeling the big O. They're feeling the sense of overwhelm. And we've discovered that a major source of that overwhelm is from applying old systems to this new world of work that we find ourselves leading. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Inspire, they come to Inspire because we get it. We're like this trusted partner uh, and advisor who also jumps right into the trenches to get work done either by advising, uh, filling interim leaves of absence for open roles, helping lean teams get work done, build scaling HR departments for high growth organizations, et cetera. And we serve our clients for 15 plus years now um, in four areas, HR business partner, talent management, talent acquisition, and total rewards. And we have a fantastic team of 30 plus experts sprinkled across 10 plus states who are all at uh, mid and senior levels who do this advising and really jumping in. So many of our clients are finding that in this volatile time, they need kind of a mashup of their permanent staff as well as fractional <laughs> resources um, to jump in. And that's why they come to us. And we love this topic of dealing with the challenge du jour for high growth scaling companies. So let's dive right in. You know, when you are the leader, as many of you know, for these rapidly growing organizations, everything comes to you from employee engagement to figuring out when to hire, who to hire, how to upskill, and always weaving in that lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, uh, which is now an overdue priority for so many organizations. So how do you do it all? We've assembled a team of experts <laughs> to help us with that exact question. So today's panel will feature three fantastic humans Corby D. Taylor, who's the Vice President of HR at Faring USA, Barry Mar Marshall, who's a founding partner of P5 Collective Consulting, and our very own Inspire expert, Mindy London, who has a deep background as HR business partner. Corby, Barry, Mindy, thank you so much for joining us today to share our wisdom. So I'd love to start with one of my fave topics, which is company culture. So, you know, when we think about all the challenges of rapidly scaling organizations, there's there's so much coming at you, right? From all the organizational priority setting to individual roles adapting. How do you begin to keep up with this consistently, you know, keep folks consistently engaged? And how do you keep that as a priority when everything is shifting? Um, at warp speed. I'd love to hear from you, you know, what are some things that leaders with a stake can look out for um, as signals that the culture is suffering with this growth and how do you address that when it comes their way? Barry, if we can kick it off with you. Sure. Happy to, to comment on that one. I think, you know, how do you see some of these things? I think if you're not watching and not listening, you're not going to be aware. So I think as I think about it, um, it is, uh, there's an old phrase that I've heard, I don't remember who said it, but you have two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion, right? So are we asking questions? Are we listening to what people have to say? Are we listening without defensiveness? And are we open to different perspectives? A lot of times people just want to know that their frustrations, their concerns have been heard. And I think the other thing for us as leaders and organizations that are going through rapid change and adaptation, we have to be authentic about um, telling people what's going on, reminding them of the why, constant communication. You can't do enough of just keeping people updated. Um, and as leaders, we have tons of context that we forget we know, and we well forget done. to share that context. And so that's it's important to just sort of take the step back and make sure that we're sharing the details and the context for people frequently and letting them know and going out of our way to listen, whether it's pulse surveys or listening tours just making sure that we're creating a, a dynamic of conversation in the organization, which keeps us aware of what's happening with the culture, but also keeps people yeah. informed and engaged and plugged into the why behind it. I love that. Two ears, one mouth in that order. That's <laughs> going to be my new buffer sticker. I yes. love <laughs> Harvey, Mindy, any thoughts from you? Yeah, so, I'll, I'll just, um, very quick, I'll just add um, to Barry's comment. I think one of the things um, that we've been trying to do at, at Faring, which we're just starting, I think depending on the size of the company that you're at, this can make sense or potentially not, but completely agree with the 
communication, the need for the auth auth authenticity and to acknowledge, you know, here's what's going really well, here's what the challenges are, but also making sure you're, you're bringing in kind of your um, next level of leaders and potentially even the next level down, again, depending on the size of, of the organization. So, you know, we're working through you know, who's on these extended leadership teams because we know that those are the leaders that are actually the feet on the street um, mm -hmm. and leading the teams. Um, so making sure that you're engaging with, with the right levels um, to make sure that they're also help, helping to, to bring the organization along. Such a good point because we can have all the culture initiatives in the mm -hmm. world, but if the leader that's front day to day facing with the staff doesn't have the yeah. script and know the messaging, then it really can get lost. Yeah. Um, I'd love to take a moment just to kind of level set of who's with us. We were going to throw up a brief poll. This one is not about whether you favor sweater, whether to baking, but we want to talk about staffing and see kind of where everyone's coming from so we can really um, use it as a framework for the conversation. We'd love to get your sense. What does your company currently do to manage all of its HR needs? So we're throwing that poll up now to get a sense of whether folks are covering all their needs in-house, outsourcing, using fractional contractors, staffing agencies, et cetera. Okay. Looks like about half of the folks with us cover their needs in-house. 60% um, covers needs in-house. 20% um, is growing our HR department. About 10% are using fractional talent. Okay, helpful. Um, so, you know, with these aggressive, um, with these aggressive um, growth goals that so many organizations have, how can HR leaders quickly establish this team that they need? So, you know, what if staffing up HR is not a high priority or the budget is not there for permanent roles as other um, departments might have. How do you keep up with the mountain of work and then prevent the burnout among your, your treasure team? Mm -hmm. um, so Mindy, do you want to kick that one off? Sure. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everybody. So, so nice to be here. So, you know, I think you need to be as a nature leader, pragmatic as well as creative. So when I think about a small team or no team in a small organization that needs HR support, I think about what are the key business goals? Where does that organization need to go? And then I very quickly back out into how can HR support and drive those goals? Because really first and foremost, besides you know, driving, making sure um, regulations are enacted and dealing with employee relations, we are business drivers and we need to strategically be, be come, um, be working in that fashion. Mm -hmm. So for example, a new, a new uh, organization has aggressive product goals. Do they need new talent? Do they need HRBP to help assess what that talent or headcount gaps are? Mm -hmm. Do they need to upscale the sales force? What development expertise might be needed? Is that a permanent hire? Is it a fractional hire? Does an org design need to happen based on the current configuration and this new product launch? If it does, then do you bring in somebody fractionally or do you look to hire full time? And those actions would essentially help the business meet their goal and then set the path for HR going forward. I love it. I just love like always linking it back to the overall goals of the organization. You know, I always say when someone's, you know, dealing with their inbox and fills that mountain of work, they can just always be reminded of how their role kind of connects to the top of the house and what the vision is of the organization. It, um, it gives them that sense of ownership. Yes. Um, Corby, thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think this is the everyday challenge. So the good news is if you if you don't get it right today, you can work on it again tomorrow. So I guess that's the upside. Um, but no, I, I, I completely agree with, with what Mindy shared. I think it's um, just making sure that that North Star is, is always clear and asking yourself the question of, is this gonna drive the business? Is this really the thing I should be doing now? Um, well, I was saying that we've been starting to use a bit more of like, is this gonna make the boat go faster? And if not, then maybe there's something else that could. Uh, and it's just about choices, right? Which is so hard, right? We all have been in places where we're like, prioritize, prioritize, simplify, easier said than done. But um, it's a space that, you know, I think as, as I mature in my career, I feel like I'm, I'm getting better at making those choices and being very deliberate about that. And mm -hmm. especially when you're growing fast, like certain mm -hmm. things make more sense to do today versus mm -hmm. others. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Oh, Barry, please go ahead. So I was just going to throw in a couple of things. <clears throat> um, 
And I, uh, just to sort of piggyback off of that, there's two articles that I often reference to people that are kind of in this vein, um, which is disrupting the CHRO, which is a, a kind of a Deloitte study slash article, and then an HBR article, People Before Strategy, and we can get folks the links to those. But it, it, at the end of the day, I think if you put all this together, right, understanding the business monetization strategy, where we're going, the talent aspect, the structure of the organization, um, and finding ways that you as an HR leader can bring value to the table. How can you help the leaders, the CEO, the CFO yeah. see things a little bit differently? Um, and it, it's not about, you know, I need this or I need that to bring value, but like take, take a step back and think of yourself as a business leader, not just the HR person, mm -hmm. but the person who's a business leader with a people lens and how can you bring value uh, to the organization in that way, um, being data-driven, the other thing I'll say in this too is just um, learning how to talk to your CFO. A lot of HR leaders struggle with, you know, financial concepts and budgets and spreadsheets and those technical details. The more you can get comfortable with that, the more you can have a, a better conversation with your CFO, because a lot of this at the end of the day comes down to understanding the financial models. And sure. if you can plug yourself in there, then you've got a better opportunity to bring value to the table. I love that. And I think many times around the table, um, when HR can really present the ROI on the initiative, the ROI on the training, the ROI on the talent management um, initiative, the engagement initiative, then it begins to um, just as to crystallize for folks. It's like land in another country and learning to speak that language. You're always seen as an insider. Yeah. 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 Mindy, earlier I was asking a little bit um, about um, culture and engagement. Did you have a thought that you wanted to add to the conversation? I'm nervous that perhaps I cut you off. Oh, no worries. Thanks. You know, I was just going to share that good leadership goes a long way there, right? So mm -hmm. similar to what I think Barry was saying, you know, inspire people not by showing them your brilliance, but by helping, their find, helping them find theirs. Mm -hmm. You know, be there, be a sounding board, listen, offer guidance, get in there, help them solve problems. But it really goes back to hiring the right people, hiring people who have good mm -hmm. emotional intelligence, as well as good technical skills, mm -hmm. setting a good framework and then letting them go, but being there for them. Um, the only other thing I would add is also, I think if you can position or brand change as a positive thing, mm -hmm. as something that is the future, it's never gonna go away. And the challenge that we all have to be better professionals is about building those skills to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I think that helps a lot for people to deal with that frustration um, and the feeling that something is happening to them as opposed to they helping to drive the change. Mm -hmm. I love that. Powerful yeah. thing. I love that. It's like that mindset of helping people feel like they're the CEO of their career and really being part of things. Yeah. Um, speaking of hiring, I would love to explore this idea of the right balance of hiring versus upskilling existing talent. And we get this question a ton because many of our clients find themselves in this economic downturn in a moment of hiring freezes, right? So it's like hire or upskill. So I'd love to hear from each of you. When does that rapid scaling provide an opportunity to upskill existing staff, you know, give them that career burst, boost and a chance to pivot, gain some exposure. And when is it better to focus on talent acquisition strategy and bringing in experienced pros from the outside? Corby, I don't know any organization in this economy growing like Farring, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I hope there's, there's many more out there. But, um, <laughs> If we find ourselves again, it's a very fortunate position to be in where we um, we are growing and have several products in FDA review that you know we're hopeful will will come into the market in the next one to two years. Um, and so uh, we've been talking a lot about this quintessential like do you build, do you buy? Uh, what's the right mix, right? Because typically, you, hopefully, there there's a mix, right? So you're giving your internal talents some opportunity. Um, so the way we're approaching it um, is. Honestly, we, we've, again, in the spirit of keeping things simple, um, we've really just looked at what are the capabilities we need, um, specifically talking about launches uh, for this particular uh, launch uh, within this area. Um, and we talked about experiences and the relationships that we need our talent to have externally, um, whether it's with physicians, with hospitals, et cetera. Um, so really getting deep into overall capability and what are the experiences that people would need to have to, to be able to build that. 
Um, and then looking at, okay, so what of that is transferable from the current sales force, for example, that we have today, um, that we could easily kind of pluck somebody who's selling within this TA and bring them over to sell in this, so long as they're supported by folks who potentially have the relationships that they might not have. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've done a mix of build and, and buy uh, based on some of the experiences that we know we need folks to have and they're specifically the relationships um, in order to get in the door. Um, we have gone external for specifically to get people with those relationships, uh, knowing that we as a company need, need them, uh, but also have spent a lot of time thinking through our, our talent that's ready to move that we know is high potential and agile, right? Where we know they can make these types of pivots. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we have a strategy in place where, you know, we're, we're bu building out the team with that balance. So people internally can feel good about, wow, I've got this new great role, but I'm also seeing some great talent that they know they can learn from. Um, and the last thing I'll just share is that we're also really very much focused on ensuring that we have a plan to upskill and enable the groups that are coming in, whether they're external or internal, um, to really shorten that, that learning curve, right? So when we get into the market, hopefully in January, uh, you know, they're, they're out and they're running. Um, so just some thoughts there. You're ready to go. And there is nothing like internal talent, seeing their peers, mm -hmm. their colleagues, get those stretch assignments, get the yeah. careers, get the promotion, whatever it might be. Always. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Barry, thoughts from you? Yeah, I think, you know, somewhat similarly, um, I think I think about sort of the, the balancing of the priorities. So, you know, in fast growth environments, particularly if you are um, venture backed or maybe even private equity backed, um, you've got a lot of demands in the organization. And so it's about placing your bets and placing smart bets when you're going to choose to upskill or when you're going to spend the money to up to buy someone from the outside at a higher level. Mm -hmm. um, as well as sort of the career development path that we're, we're talking about as well. I do think, you know, the other thing I'll say that I think I've seen organizations struggle with is when they do choose to upskill, um, how are you really making sure you're going to support that person's ability to succeed? Mm -hmm. are, is it coaching, an external coach, a mentor, a guide? You're asking someone to step up and if they've never seen that role performed at that level, mm -hmm. how are you, you, you've got to be able to support them to do that. You can't just sort of expect them to go figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. So I think mean, that's another component we have to think about, yeah. particularly when we're going the upskill path. Absolutely. And if the upskilling also involves being a people leader for the first time, there's such a different set of competencies. Oh, and yeah. there is like yeah. a new sheriff in town. Like I feel like before the pandemic, <laughs> sometimes the leadership competencies included, like, will they work a gazillion hours and hop on a flight with little notice to go to Dell's little <laughs> client? Or are they good at golf? Mm -hmm. And now it's a little bit more of EQ holding space for authentic yeah. conversations, yeah. making room for conversations about wellness yeah. and mental health with an exhausted employee population. I mean, many leaders don't have that muscle because they haven't seen it role modeled um, yeah. either. Yeah, and I, that, I would say that applies whether we're talking about upskilling, like the mm -hmm. whole management tier and investing in what a manager yeah. does and needs to do. It, that's a whole, we could spend hours on that conversation. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'd love to touch on this moment that we find ourselves in. We'd inspire, follow many economists, and I'm using the term for um, for now, soft recession. That's what I'm calling it for now. Next month, who knows what we'll be calling it. But th the economic slowdown that we find ourselves in, you know, it often leads to things being on sale, right? There can be this kind of consolidation and increase in mergers and acquisition. And so many clients that we're working with are thinking about, when that time might be for them. Um, clearly Q1 seems to be the earliest, but we're always about preparation and being ready for what's around the corner. So with that in mind, it's um, almost, you know, it's here we are in October. I'd love to hear from each of you tips for HR leaders who are approaching a merger acquisition, whether it's now or in the next couple of quarters, and what, you know, leaders at high growth companies who don't yet have any M&A on the radar, like, what should they be doing now anyway, just to get ready? Should 23 bring that about for them? Mindy, do you want to kick that one off? Sure. So, you know, I think um, as having worked at large companies and small companies and everything in between, I think what I've learned most of all is that culture is key. 
when looking at mergers and acquisitions, and also oftentimes it's overlooked. So my first part bit of advice would be just think about the culture. Is this a good culture fit? Uh, the numbers may be there, the product mesh may be there, but if we are going to combine workforces, is this really going to work? And I tell a personal story where I was on a um, acquisition team way back and we were looking to purchase a small company. They were out in California. And, and I worked at a large company at that time. And they were, they would like take the afternoons off and they would go surfing, literally. And we loved it, loved it, loved it. They loved us until they started to understand that, oh, we have like quarterly, um, we have quarterly legal and compliance training. We have all sorts of things that happen from a bureaucratic standpoint in this large behemoth company that you and your workforce are now going to have to take mm. part in. Mm. And that conversation was so key because it quickly, or maybe not so quickly, but eventually killed the deal for both parties huh. because it was deemed that it just, they weren't gonna be who they were huh. in our organization right. and they probably wouldn't have been as successful. So we walked away as did they. So I'd say culture is key. Do the values of the organizations have a chance of meshing? I mean, they should be aligned. I mean, typically in small organization, those m as impact people in a way that they feel them very, very strongly. Sure. Sometimes it's right. It's a little bit less when you're in a big company. So I would just say, keep those things in mind. Do a lot of planning if the deal go, does go into effect. You know, think about what does day one look like? How are we going to combine all our processes and technologies? Mm -hmm. um, what happens to the people? Is there role duplication, et cetera? I love the example. You know, I always think of, um, as you know, you've worked with us on many m &E projects, and there is this whole framework that we use for um, the due diligence pre, the integration post, mm -hmm. and do y'all surf on Fridays was never one of my questions <laughs> for due diligence, but I'm going to add that to our matrix. <laughs> so, but that is such a telling question. Like, what do people do when they have work from home days? Are they legit working yeah. from home on those days, or are they using it to do more things to kind of fill their well? Um, there's probably a whole new set of questions that we should be adding. So if you, <laughs> list, Barry, you have also been in the space for a while. Any questions that come to mind for you or any insights? Yeah, I think just to, to build uh, a little bit off of what <clears throat> Mendy mentioned, um, I think, you know, I think about documenting the culture, like with rubrics and definitions mm -hmm. and yeah. really understanding it as opposed to just, and I'm not suggesting many was saying this, but like, make sure you're really going beyond a list of words or phrases, but like really digging in. Right. The other thing I think that's important is norms. And, and we don't talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are the norms of behavior in the organization from a leadership perspective? What is the leadership style, the decision-making authority? How do things get done? A good friend of mine, uh, his firm was recently acquired and uh, you know there were a set of expectations around how things would work and it was completely different. And unfortunately for him, it affected his team. So even though he was trying to insulate them, the, the direction, the guidance from the top were things he couldn't subvert and, and he lost half his team because the whole nature of the organization shifted. And so what had been hoped to retain from a talent perspective was out the door and he was stuck rebuilding the team for things he couldn't control, right? So I, I think the more you, you, you almost probably can't do enough in terms of really understanding it, but the more granular you can get of understanding what are what's your expectations of people from a norms behavior perspective mm -hmm. and really sort of identifying that with you know potential parties mm -hmm. Uh, that you're looking at from a merger acquisition perspective. You raise a really good point. We often in HR circles talk about it from the acquiring point of view, but there's also a point of view of the acquired. And what you touched on is so important. The idea of having your company acquired, losing your talent and having to rebuild the team is not the way that typically um, owners of companies picture those first couple of years. They picture yeah. themselves more in an advisory type role, um, not rebuilding the team from scratch. So that's really tricky. Um, and then on the, on the, um, integration side, it's really about bringing together two families, right? And really okay. kind of being intentional. Mindy, I love what you said about have a plan for day one, day 30, day 60, right? Have these checkpoints to make sure that it's not just about the balloon drop confetti and the excitement of the champagne popping virtually <laughs> when the deal goes down, but really keeping that, um, keeping that energy alive. Um, I want to switch gears to, um, HRIS, which um, is an area that I think sometimes can make or break small organizations um, who are on their path to scale. So, you know, 
how do you know when it's time to move beyond the Google Sheets and the Excel docs? Um, is there a, a trigger? And do you have any tips for orienting the team to use these new tools? Um, I'd also love to hear from you any kind of common pitfalls, mistakes that you've seen that um, folks can watch out for to engage um, a tech solution. So Barry, I'm going to turn it over to you on that one. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think first and foremost, watch out for the squirrels. Um, you know, we tend to sort of be like the, was it up, I think, where the, you know, the dogs were like squirrel, right? We, we tend to like yeah. fixate and find these bright, shiny objects, right? right? And go after them. Like, oh my gosh, that's the latest, <laughs> greatest, exciting right. thing. Um, and sure, there's a lot of great tools out there. Um, but I think, you know, in my view, from what I've seen with my clients, my experience is you, you have to be strategic and thoughtful about it. You need to solve tomorrow's problems, not today's problems. So because switching platforms is incredibly difficult challenging for the organization, challenging for your team, risky from a data quality perspective, continuity perspective. So think several years out. We all have problems today, but what are the problems that are going to come? What is the trajectory? No one has a crystal ball, but think about that in your solution set. The other thing is, is prioritizing, balancing the needs and trade-offs. Um, we can think about it in point solutions. So a great HRIS, a great ATS, a great payroll system, a great benefit admin system. That's great. There are massively great point solutions out there, but it, the more point solutions you have, the more connection issues, challenges you're going to have uh, that have to be managed. So think about it holistically and take the step back and say, what's really most important to the organization, my team, the future? Um, and can I solve you know, sort of the Pareto principle, the 80-20? Can I get most of it with this? Uh, and this one solution has HRIS, ATS, and payroll, and the bid mad admin is just okay. But you know what? If it's all integrated, it speaks to one another. My gosh, that will save you so much time, headache, and data right. risk. So Good just, enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so be mindful, I think, about that. Um, and that's as well as just having sort of a more strategic mindset because you don't you don't want to build the reputation of being the one who chases squirrels. Um, because that's just you're not you're not adding value to the organization mm -hmm. by chasing squirrels. Mm -hmm. You've got to sort of think about it holistically. Oh, yeah. I love these points. And, you know, Mindy, you've taught me so much over the years about change. There's also change fatigue with this. And for lean teams that have some um, such a large remit, it is hard to get up to speed on three new tech systems all at once. So it's like know thyself, like really knowing who's on your team and if they can handle all that change. And, and had a, I mean, the change you have, but like how to pace it. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. And, you know, one of the things I would expect to build on that and what Barry was saying is, you know, you kind of know when you're ready, I think, especially in a small organization, you find that the people, the person who's been tasked with this or the two people are spending more and more and more time doing these sorts of admin things. Um, and then you're getting requests from data from someone in a department and it's taking too long to pull or a regulator is coming in tomorrow and, oh, my God, I've got to get these records out right? Who took what training? So you kind of know when you can no longer handle it, but I couldn't agree more that you want to be really mindful with what you purchase, what you go into. Um, and although some of the better systems are a bit rigid and clunky, I think they do offer some of the better like um, usability down the road. Uh, that's just been what I've learned. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of behavior, Jamie, you asked the question, yeah. how do you get people, you know, what's in it for them? That's the key. Uh, when you can show somebody why it makes sense for them to go online, to, you know, type in their vacation days or to do some basic admin or why for a leader, they need to press a button and they can move this person from their team to another team, as opposed to filling out mm -hmm. all of this paperwork. As soon as you show them that, I think the job is done. I always use this example with our clients. So for any of us who have, I don't know, more than one physician, each of them have their own portal with their own password. And I know about you all, I can never remember them. And then one day I was like, Jamie Cohen Klein, you are going to sit so still and you are going to figure out how to get into these portals and like update some prescription. And I finally got in and it was like, ah, uh, like the heavens open the angels. And I was like, oh my God, everything's in here. And I realized- yeah. It had every piece of lab work I'd ever done. Every this person, this little prescription I was trying to track down. It was wild, and I was like, "Oh, this is change management that we teach to our clients." It is such a heavy lift, and I think that if my physician had given me the why and been like, "Jane, you can get stuff faster," 
I would have saved the sticky note with that little password. <laughs> so it's about almost, there's like almost like a marketing campaign that you need to do to the end yeah. user, I think, but it really does streamline things so much. Um, you know, I want to switch gears to this moment that we find ourselves in um, where there is a additional focus on transparency, authenticity, and we're seeing it pop up in compensation. So for many of us here, uh, I see folks who have joined who are in the New York City area in less than a month. NYC is requiring that the salary mm -hmm. range is included in job postings. We've talked about this um, in past Inspire Live series. So I um, want to make sure everyone got the memo on that. But before we okay. talk about the opportunities and challenges around pay transparency, I'm, I would love to pop up another poll to see where your company is on this issue, um, just to understand, you know, how is trade um, pay transparency impacting posting salary ranges and job listings? Um, is it affecting your total reward strategy? I'm seeing a trend that to get in front of things, many organizations are now just listing compensation ranges for all roles. Um, so change is unfolding for us in state by state. Um, things are definitely taking off. So this seems to be a mix where we have, okay, so we have 30% of people are currently reviewing it. Fantastic. We have 27 more days. 30% um, have not considered pay transparency within the total reward strategy. Okay. And then the balance um, are starting to, okay. So about 20% are starting to publish those salary ranges. Yeah, it's interesting. We've seen a lot of folks really since July start to make that practice where they're putting the salary ranges up there just to start really strengthening that muscle. Okay. So it seems like in some, we have an enthusiastic group of learners. Everyone's at their journey into storm yeah. for NYC. And if you have any jobs at all in NYC, even if you're based in Chicago, it's November one. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay. So I'd love to just set the table here. Does pay transparency pose any particular opportunities or challenges to HR leaders at scaling companies who already have so much on their plate? So Porvi, if you can start this one. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to, um, to talk about this uh, with the group because it sounds like we do have a, a mashup of people in, in uh, d different places. And um, it's something I've thought about as a leader, but something we're within fairing really um, in the midst of fig figuring out because it's New York now, but it'll be other places soon. So I think it's just a matter of if you're in a company that is, you know, in more than one state, <laughs> then you probably need need to start think thinking about this pretty quickly. Um, so I honestly, I think there's more advantages than disadvantages. Uh, and I, I do think that um, at first, when I heard about this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a disaster. It's going to be so tough. Like, how, how is this all going to work? But I think when you consider how transparency can drive employee attraction, uh, retention, and pay equity, right, which are all sort of three very hot topics, I think, for, for the world, um, I think pay transparency can play a, play a massive role. Um, you know, when you look at the research, and, you know, we all see articles that you know, wage gaps still exist, right? Pay transparency can really help to um, sort of lessen that gap that does exist. Because if you're basing what we used to do or probably what we still do is, oh, I make this today and tomorrow I want to make this, but pay transparency blows all of that up because you're really benchmarking yourself to the market versus what you made before. Because if what you made before wasn't competitive, it's really probably not the best benchmark. And so I think that transparency can really help level the playing field um, across the wage gaps that we know are still there. Um, and then I think from an internal perspective, you know, I'm sure many of us have seen a lot of surveys that ask that question. You know, I can't remember the wording, but something like I'm satisfied with my pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's never positive. In 25 years, I'm pretty sure I've never seen positive employee responses on that. And at least now you may still remain unsatisfied with your pay, but at least you don't question where you are in the market. Mm -hmm. And yes, the range might be broad, but at least you know from a competitive perspective um, where you're positioned and as part of that, you know, how your company thinks about pay. And there's just more transparency, not just on the number, but the philosophy of pay and total rewards, right? Because I don't think you can just look at just the base salary, right? Because there's yeah. so much more that, that employers are, are, are offering. Um, 
And the other upside, I think, listen, it drives a ton of accountability, right? As, as an employer, mm-hmm. you know, we feel very accountable to do right by our existing talent, to go external, benchmark these jobs, and make mm-hmm. sure we do have pay uh, transparency and pay equity. And so mm-hmm. I think it can really be uh, an attractive quality for an employer to have. Um, and research does show that people that, co- sorry, companies that that are transparent about pay, that's where people want to work because they know that that's a value of the company, mm-hmm. that they care about equity, they care about being fair, mm-hmm. uh, and it probably speaks to the culture of yes. the company. <laughs> and so yeah. I think there's so many factors that can work in our favor mm-hmm. uh, as an employer, but also as employees are our, mm-hmm. our, our, ourselves, right? Because I'd want to know that too, right? As a person who's working. Yeah. Um, the, the downside, I would say, you know, honestly, is people might price themselves out of a job, right? If you say, oh, the range is here, they probably pay in the middle. And so on the other hand, it could close some folks off from considering roles that mm-hmm. potentially the company would pay at the high end or you know, they could lateral versus going up. So, uh, you know, I think that that's so individual and it really depends on what are the, you know, experiences that you're trying to, you know, get as you build your career. Um, and then we need to do going back to change management, right? Which has been a big theme and so many other questions that we've we've chatted about. You need to make sure your, your organization and your leaders are ready to have the conversations, right? Because these are not all hunky-dory, amazing, oh my God, you're at the top of the pay range, right? It's probably not that more of the time. Um, but, you know, we've got to upskill our leaders and that's something we're th- thinking about. Like, how do you have the conversation? What is the philosophy, like the philosophy we have as a company in terms yes. of how we want to pay? And that's a very individual conversation. So how you prepare people for that is, it's a lot, it's a lot. But I think if you can get it right most of the time, I think it can be much more uh, of an advantage versus a disadvantage, but it's, you know, it's going to be new, new territory. Yes. Like everything that feels like new territory, yeah. like HR's role has just been permanently elevated to mission yeah. critical on all things. And now to the list is really mm-hmm. preparing these leaders. Um, we were talking to a client yesterday about this exact situation. How transparent do you get in front of it? And I said, look, you know, business insider just announced that both TikTok and Amazon executives have shared their pay. It really is about kind of that kind of getting on the bus a bit and just being part of this change. And what you don't want to be is the last mover. Um, because mm-hmm. I think this, what I said to the client, like, especially our Gen Y and Gen Z candidates and colleagues yeah. are looking for equity within the whole DEIB umbrella. They really want to see that um, across mm-hmm. the employee experience. So it's an interesting time, but it is definitely a new thing on the list of so many of our clients. Barry, any thoughts from your perspective? Um. <clears throat> No, I think uh, Pervy hit a lot of them. Um, I think it, and it just, it does sort of push. I think when, when you don't have clarity and you don't set um, transparency around these things, there's assumptions. And when people make assumptions, they're always going to go to the worst case scenario, right? They're going to assume the worst. And so it's about dispelling that. And I think, you know, with the conversations that are happening today, like, you know, as organizations, we should be valuing equity. Uh, at, at sort of across the table and minimizing and eliminating uh, wage gaps. So I, I, you, I don't know, almost, it's almost like, how do you not have this conversation? I do think you just need, also need to be aware that this does go beyond that. I think as you start talking about pay transparency, total compensation transparency, you're now going to have to be more transparent about other things within the organization. Otherwise, it's going to seem disingenuous that we talk with clear transparency about compensation, but not about this other stuff, right? So it's going to create some issues for organizations to really sort of get more comfortable with different layers of transparency, even outside the compensation realm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, not a skill taught in leadership classes 20 years ago, right? So a lot of people who are in leadership roles grew up at a time where these things were not in the PowerPoint for how to be an effective leader, right? So it's about how do you quickly upskill um, folks. So, um, and just a reminder, we're going to go to Q&A in just a couple of minutes. So this is a great time to pop any questions you have in the chat. A lot of folks sent in questions before today's Inspire Live that we'll we'll dive into in about um, five minutes or so. So startup HR, uh, you know, startup and high growth CEOs are among the busiest people on the planet. So 
How do we as HR leaders ensure that DEIB remains a priority for leadership teams that are stretched so thin? I feel like everyone had this on the top of their agenda. Um, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, there was this overdue racial reckoning in our country and so many leaders really, you know, got on the big stage, town hall, Zoom, small forums, and really started talking about these commitments. And it breaks my heart, but I'm I'm just not seeing the same momentum. And we're uh, slightly obsessed with weaving DEIB into the whole employee experience at Inspire. We're always mm -hmm. bringing that into dialogue. And it is about ruthlessly prioritizing for a lot of these CEOs. And this doesn't feel like the board or the market is asking as much as they did from them um, mm -hmm. in the summer of 20. So any wisdom um, on that, I'd love to share. Barry, do you want to kick that one off? Sure. Yeah, I think um, a couple of things, you know, the assumption here is you can't afford and small high growth organizations probably don't have the money to sort of hire a chief diversity officer, which would help solve some of those challenges, at least from a resource constraint perspective. But I think as HR leaders, it's about leveraging the team that we have and what are the tools that you can put in place to leverage the existing leadership team to embed more of the DEIB strategy throughout the organization. One of the, one of the tools that I like to use with that is a team charter and forcing your leadership team, not as a project team, but as a leadership team to document a charter um, and the why they exist, all those sorts of things. But two other things to think about in that charter are norms and roles. Mm -hmm. So what are the norms of how we behave as a leadership team and what are the roles that we play and documenting things like inclusion. So who on the team, and maybe it rotates, is responsible for making sure that everyone at the table has had an opportunity to contribute to the conversation in a meaningful way. And the more we build those muscles, even among the leadership team, the more that those are going to, diff uh, not diffuse, but will, will infuse themselves deeper into the organization. Yeah. Um, and, and I think on, on that team charter piece of helping the leadership team see and, and document uh, in their own words, hopefully, um, that they see themselves as champions of the DEIB strategy for the organization um, and own carrying that down. So it isn't just the HR job or the people team's job, but it is every leader's uh, component of that. And then I think just using tools that you have, whether it's, you know, uh, CultureAmp or Qualtrics for surveys, or whether it's going back to the previous conversation around compensation, are you using studies mm -hmm. like Radford, Carta, Payscale, external stuff to bring in that data market view so that you've got a point of reference and it's not just, you know, I think this sounds good, right? Anyway, that's, I'll, I'll stop there. It's great. It's great. And I think, yeah, yeah. thank you for all of this. Um, Mindy Porvi, anything to add to Barra's brilliance? Um, I would just add, um, you know, in a world, let's say you're the one HR person, I think it's about, it's culture, right? And culture is another theme that we've talked a lot about and building an inclusive culture is such a key part of this. And even if shareholders aren't asking for it, if your boards aren't asking for it, employees are asking for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that um, regardless, that culture of in, in inclusion is such an important part of what people are looking for, for them from their place of work and feeling like they belong, whether you're a person of color or what, whatever, it doesn't even matter. I think everyone wants to feel like they belong. And so that's just a great foundation to start setting. And it's, I almost wonder like, is if you build it, they, they, they will come, right? Absolutely. And so if you have to pick a, a spot to start, start with inclusion yep. because that, that is the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think it can also, it can show up in large ways, which Barry alluded to, but also small things. Whenever we do a benefits project, we always try to add to the conversation while we're there. Do you have BIPOC representation on your in-network mental health care providers? Do mm -hmm. primary care physicians in-network do physicals for transgender employees without a hiccup? Right? Like these yeah. small things that we, and it's the power of suggestion. We are in a moment of um, power when we're talking to our benefit vendors. So kind of just the more you bring those things up, the more um, change, much needed yeah. change in the country, I think, will happen. So, so Jamie, can I just real ooh. very quickly, because I know we're behind, you know, um, just a couple of things. I would be curious to learn more from CEOs as to why their emphasis has changed or shifted. So maybe as an HR leader, talking with your CEO or leadership team to understand, did things not work out or, or what happened? Why is yeah. it's no longer the flavor of the month as it should never have been, but obviously it did all come to the forefront at once. And I would work with them in a very um, specific way to reinvigorate that. The other thing I would say is younger generations can help to make, and I think someone alluded to that, 
you know, focus on the younger generations who will way more naturally just yeah. make that happen mm -hmm. and with little or no effort. And mm -hmm. so I think if you, you know, CEO top down and bottom up with the younger generation in the workplace will give you some momentum, I think. It's fantastic. Before we jump into Q&A, there's a bunch of questions. Um, I want to just close with the most important question for me, which is what are each of you doing for self-care? We are laser focused on self-care at Inspire. I think that HR has taken on such a role, particularly since the pandemic. And it's so critical that we put on our own oxygen mask, if you will, um, before we can help those around us. So Mindy, what do you do for self-care? And people um, can feel free to pop their ideas in the chat. We're always looking to crowd surf and get great innovation here. So, so very quickly, you know, just a mental effort to live more now in the moment. And it may seem, you know, very hokey, but you know, my life has always been, had always been work and then everything after work. Um, and then I made a conscious decision to change that a couple of years ago. And mm -hmm. I do work now and I do many other things. And so that for me has been a huge uh, liberating activity. And I'm doing things like volunteer work in a museum. I'm doing bike riding. I'm taking courses on history and other things. And it's really, it's wonderful. So mm -hmm. I say, just make that make that change. Sometimes it's not so easy to do, but you know, you got to take little bits and pieces as, as you can. Carving at the time, I've seen pictures of you and your husband in route <laughs> with your bike helmets. And I'm always inspired. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, sure. what are you doing? Um, I, I do something very simple, which for me has been game changing. Um, I wake up and I don't look at my phone. And I used to be the person who wakes up and looks at the phone and the emails and and now for a while now, I just, I don't do that. I, I wake up, I take five or 10 minutes just to, I stretch, I mean, maybe because I'm getting old, so I'm creaky and, you know, but I literally, I'll just stretch, I'll do some deep breaths. Yeah. So, I mean, some might call that meditation. Sometimes I might put a meditation on and it's just yeah. a few minutes as a way to start my day. I love it. I don't look at my phone anymore just because I, I feel like it, that's not the note I want to start on. I want to start with kind of more peace, calm and centering. Mm. Um, which can again be two minutes, but it's really made a difference. Um, and then when I go to my phone, I'm, I don't know, I just feel less caught up in that moment. I'm just like, okay, yeah, yeah that, that happened. Now let me go get ready to get to work. So beautiful. in our living room, we have a charging station, which is essentially a power strip and all four phones are parked there. In the there. Yeah. Um, and then, Good. yeah. Um, Barry. Yeah, I think, well, maybe two things. One, uh, I'm fortunate to live near water, but just like taking a moment throughout the day to like look at that water and be like, it's so peaceful. Um, and the other sort of, it's sort of a mantra um, is do not fear what has not happened. Mm. Right. So just life is stressful, dealing in the people space, you're dealing with people's lives and it just, I mean, not life and death usually, um, but like, you know, it's their well-being, it's their compensation. Like there's a lot of stuff that really matters deeply to people and it can get stressful um, and we can worry about what's going to happen. But like, that doesn't do me any good. It's, it's as Mindy said, living in the now, but like, do not fear what has not happened. Mm, I love these mindsets. And just That's again, great. as I said, um, when we were preparing Mindy and Barry both live in places of our beautiful country that were in the potential line of Hurricane Ian. And I am so thrilled that you and your families both did well and that um, you're with us here today. Gratitude for that. Gratitude for that. To see you both dry. And just prayers um, and positive energy yeah. sending to all of our colleagues and friends and family that were um, in that in that hurricane's path. Um, before we head to Q&A um, that you've submitted, we, you can always um, email us at hello at inspirehumanresources.com um, or book time with our fabulous chief of staff, Karen Harwood, to talk about any of the things that we're covering today or anything that's keeping you up at night. Okay, here we go. The speed round from Bradley, who popped it in the chat. How do you promote someone with a brief tenure without isolating someone in a similar role who is longer tenure? Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll take it first. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mindy. Sorry, you know, I think you, it's got to be, you've got to be fair and equitable, right? So there's got to be a res, something that they did. What is the result? What have they achieved mm -hmm. for the organization? Transparency, sort of easy to assess um, and easy to explain to mm -hmm. others. And I think there's, it's hard to argue why someone might get a promotion or a bump um, if they've actually done something worthy of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Next and I, oh, oh. Sorry, and I, just to add to that, like I would, if you're take a human view of this and, and do exactly what Mindy just said, but also proactively have the conversation with the person that you think might feel mm -hmm. isolated, like let them know. And if it's explainable, mm -hmm. they'll understand it. They may disagree, but they'll understand why you made the decision. Totally. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Absolutely. Barry, this one's heading for you. As an HR leader, where do we turn for professional development? <laughs> yeah, I, look, I mean, there are, t there are tons of places. I mean, a lot of people go to SHRM, but there's lots of other conferences. I think, uh, Jamie, you had mentioned Troop HR, um, you know, read articles in Harvard Business Review, but there's tons of networking events. A lot of the platforms have conferences. So like go to those, listen in on those, go to recordings, um, build your network, reach out to people to learn mm -hmm. about their career trajectory right. and key things that they've learned from their journey and how you can make that part of your own. And just uh, people love to talk about themselves. So just ask them and people will respond. Um, and you'll get to have some interesting conversations and then you're building your own network of people you can turn to for help. Fantastic. Next up, the I, I'm just going to fly through because we have a bunch. The idea of pay transparency and benchmarking is all sorts of daunting for an HR team of one. Do you have any advice to get on the right track with such a lean team? Uh, so I, I'm just going to throw. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Perky. No, I, was, I we thought this question might come up, <laughs> and it did. Um, I think you know, listen, it, it is difficult when you have one person, but this is where um, you your network becomes that much more critical because mm -hmm. you know coming from large companies that are so well resourced i never had to network and well i never felt like i did I, but now it's different and so you have to develop that group of people that you can go go to and then i would also say you know even online like when you look at salary.com uh, for example there's a lot of online resources it's not perfect mm -hmm. right and this is where you got to follow 80, 20 and 70, 30, depending on the roles, but there is d data out there that's accessible as a, as a single HR leader. Um, mm -hmm. So between those two things, network and online, you, you, you may be able to benchmark your most critical roles for sure. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you can always call Inspire because we get yes. these <laughs> all the time. Okay, next up, Mindy, this one is coming for you as one of our change experts. What is the common pitfall when navigating change within an organization? What is the, I know there's a bunch of common pitfalls, but mm -hmm. what's the top two? So I think that's a great question. And I think my first thing that comes to mind is um, you haven't aligned the person who you've tasked with leading the change properly across the organization. And okay. so their impact is not going to be maximum. So what I mean is oftentimes, let's say you report to a CEO, it's a larger organization, and you are tasked with driving, let's say you're the CHRO, and you're tasked with driving a new HR process across the organization. Well, the other people who report to the CEO, right? I mean, you're tasked with driving it across, but the people, your colleagues, your peers don't report to you. Mm -hmm. So although you hope they really want this and are gonna do the right thing, and even if they don't want it, they'll do the right thing, right. your CEO really needs to be the one driving it, right. not the HR leader. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Oftentimes the wrong person is tasked with driving and the change either takes longer or it's less effective. Yeah. Okay, okay, excellent. Next, we've started to scale fast from bootstrapping to formalizing operations and building out departments. We don't have a senior HR person in place yet and are having trouble finding the right person. Do you have any advice for recruiting for that magic person and for keeping things moving forward until we fill it? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, I mean, I think from the, I mean, I'll, I'll, there's administrative and strategic two big buckets. Administrative, like you should be using a PEO. If you're not, go find a PEO, get mm -hmm. that administrative stuff off your plate, mm -hmm. off of anybody's plate. Mm -hmm. um, the strategic side, yeah, I mean, it, I think there's a couple of things, you know, one, you know, maybe be creative. Um, I came from an operations background. I don't have, I didn't grow up in the HR space, but made the transition. And sometimes you can find great people, leaders who have different backgrounds. So mm -hmm. maybe be open to an internal person that could grow and develop into that space by giving them that responsibility. Um, you know, the other is, again, use your network, right? Mm -hmm. Build and use that network of like, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Do you know anybody that's looking might be interested with a couple beyond, you know, the paying for a recruiter, which is also another solution sure. um, would be like, you know, use yeah. a partner to help you find that person if you're not. 
already. Absolutely. And again, you can always call us. We get these requests all the time and we do the like running start, fill in, scale the department until someone's in place. Next up, how do you recruit the right talent for due diligence phase of M&A that is time specific? Hmm. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure that I understand. That. How do you recruit the right person for the due diligence phase of merger and acquisition work, given that it's so time sensitive and specific? You know, I think you mm. need to have, you need to be working with people from inside the company mm -hmm. as they are best. If I understand the question correctly, mm -hmm. they're the best ones to really assess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think you need to pull in people from the business, working with business leaders to get the right, uh, the right mix, get a team together and lead that team or the business leads that team and HR is a full participant. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I would also say on online, there's a lot of resources. Um, and I know you can't find everything on Google, but there, there's a lot there. So on Sherm, for example, there's toolkits on M&A and mm -hmm. other sites where you know, if, if it's new for, for you, go online and you'll, you'll see what, what are the key considerations as you're mm -hmm. integrating yourself on, onto that deal, deal team and Absolutely. work, work, work your network. You probably know somebody that's done this before. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And like mm -hmm. almost creating your own external board of directors, folks who can kind of advise yep. um, as you yeah. go through career journey and also look to build. So that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you again. Great to gather. Again, you can always catch past Inspire Live episodes on our site, or um, if you want to download our podcast, it's called Inspired. Great to be together. Be well, stay healthy, Thank and we'll you. see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.